Welcome everyone from the beautiful campus of Notre Dame. It's an absolutely gorgeous day here in South Bend. Uh, temperature, temperatures are pushing 70 degrees. Students are all over the campus, walking, exercising, taking advantage of the weather and the fresh air for as long as we can. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we are here um, for the second episode of Fighting Irish Foodies. And we're coming to you from gorgeous Foley's uh, in O'Neill Hall and the Notre Dame Stadium. So we're the south uh, end of the, the stadium and we're overlooking uh, the parking lots where we hope we're gonna see you uh, very shortly this fall uh, for the upcoming football season. Fighting Irish Foodies is a monthly cooking show and every month we'll have a brand new chef from Notre Dame or from within the Notre Dame family to join us. This next hour or so, it's all about having some fun, learning a thing or two, and not laughing at my ineptitude in the kitchen. Actually, uh, I believe my wife and my mother are watching in uh, because they find it terribly ironic that I would be hosting uh, a cooking show. I'm joined, thankfully, by a terrific chef that you're gonna meet in a second who will take it from there. Before we get started, I feel compelled to let everyone know that we're working in a very safe environment. A plexiglass structure sits between the chef and me, uh, and all of our camera operators are masked and also at a safe distance away. So let's get rolling. A favorite holiday of many in the Notre Dame family is St. Patrick's Day. So joining us today is the executive chef of Legends of Notre Dame, Chef Josh Marin, to te teach us how to make a meal for your St. Patrick's Day celebrations at home. Josh, thank you so much for joining us. Are you ready to get us started? Thank you, Lou. Absolutely. I'm Good. very excited. We're going to make Guinness stew today. So as far as the ingredients, um, we'll go over most of them as we go, but we, uh, we have beef that I've cubed up ahead of time. I used a uh, chuck sirloin. And also Guinness, of course, the heart of the stew. <laughs> I love it. I must say that I've already tapped into my Guinness ah, here. Ah, nice. <laughs> Guinness, as you know, is the official beer of Notre Dame alumni and fans everywhere, and uh, I'm, I'm taking it beyond the stew. <laughs> it's one of my favorites as well, thank you. Um, so as far as the equipment, you know, this is um, actually the main piece of equipment that we're gonna use. This is an enameled cast iron pot. Um, the brand is Le Creuset. But they're also known as Dutch or French ovens, but it is such a versatile tool. Mm -hmm. I find it's honestly my favorite piece of equipment at home. Um, it's really heavy. It is. It's yeah. A, yeah, the whole thing is cast iron. And that, that enameled layer, you know, between the cast iron and the enamel, it makes for a really nice, thick um, surface that the heat has to go through. It makes for a more moderate heat. And for a long cooking item like this that we're going to make today, it's just perfect. That's great. Um, we're actually going to show the use stove top but you could certainly transfer it to the oven once you have all the ingredients in and just kind of forget about it and let it do its thing for a few hours and it's almost like a crock pot in that regard like a, a sophisticated crock pot amazing <laughs> so since i'm such a neophyte to all this you know i always thought that the ingredients are so important to also having a terrific chef but I didn't realize that the instruments, uh, the tools are also really critical. Absolutely. I mean, I'd like to think that you could make this in any pot, but I think that uh, this will definitely enhance the flavor and give mm -hmm. you a more depth of flavor. You know, like I said, you could make something like this entirely in the crock pot, but you're not going to get that depth of flavor. And I'll kind of explain that as we go. Good. The first step is actually, uh, let's get gloved up, Lou. Okay. We're going to handle some raw meat. Got it. And then we're gonna go ahead and kick on the uh, propane burner as well, once you're ready. Okay. And then we are going to take the beef that I cubed up ahead of time. Okay. Was I supposed to put that thing up or not? <laughs> no, that stays down. That stays and then down. you just click that, uh, the dial all the way to the left. Yep, you, yep, wow. you got it, perfect. Yeah. All right. You got it. Just go ahead and leave it on high. Mom, I did it. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> I got it on. <laughs> Off to a good start. Yeah. Grab your uh, stainless steel bowl after okay. you get gloved. Yep. And then uh, we're going to put the beef right in there. Okay. We're going to go ahead and season it pretty liberally with some kosher salt and some pepper. 
I would say that's about two teaspoons. You know, I never honestly measure at home. Mm -hmm. um, I just kind of go by feel. Is, is that true about great chefs that they don't they don't really follow the measurements that they just have a touch? I feel it is. You know, once you have the technique mastered, you yeah. can kind of just go with the flow, if you will. You know. Um, I'm okay. going to go ahead and add flour. Flour? Just go ahead and, I don't know, sprinkle about a tablespoon in there, and we're going to coat the beef with the flour and the salt and pepper. Did you already put the pepper in, too? Yes, sir. I did okay. about a teaspoon, so about half as much pepper as you do salt. Okay, got it. Okay. And then, once you get it nice and coated with flour, you don't want a ton, you know, just enough flour to kind of coat all of the meat. And this is actually, the flour is what's going to thicken the beef stock as the stew cooks. So that's how you end up with a really nice, thick liquid in your stew. Mm -hmm. So now, um, once I get it tossed in the flour and the salt and pepper, I'm going to go ahead and take my gloves off. And I'd can put you, about a tablespoon or... Show us what, I want to see how much flour you got in there. Sure. So just okay. enough to kind of coat the beef. You know, got you don't it. want okay. it a ton. And then I put about a tablespoon, maybe a little bit more of oil in the pan. Okay. We're gonna let it get nice and hot, like I said. Now this is a very important step at home when you're doing this. Depending on the size of the pot you're using and how much meat you have, you don't wanna just dump it all in there. This is actually one of the most important steps in developing that flavor that we talked about. We're gonna get a good sear on the meat. And if you dump all the meat in there, it's not going to get evenly browned, you know, like it's, it's going to be really difficult to get that good browning all over. I wouldn't have known that. That's good to know. So hopefully we're up to a good temperature here. It should be getting there. Might wait just a second. And then we're going to go ahead and put the beef in there. And like I said, we're going to get it seared and kind of brown up all over on all the sides. I'm going to go ahead and I think it could probably wait just another second, but I'm going to go ahead and put it in there now. Yeah, I've got a nice little sizzle there. I'm going to go ahead and put all of mine in there. I know I warned you about crowding the pan, but I think it should be just about a perfect fit for this amount of meat. Now, once you get your meat in there, you might have to give it just a little drizzle of some extra oil around the outside. Make sure there's plenty in there. That will also help with the browning. Now, what kind of oil is this? Is this just uh, this olive oil? A, or? It's a combination. Um, so it's canola oil blended with olive oil. Now, olive oil, I'm glad you asked, has a really low smoke point. So it's not great for sauteing. It's really good for salads or for finishing things with. But you don't really want to cook, especially when you're going to do something at such a high heat as this. It will uh, burn and give an off taste to what you're cooking. Oh, so, so you want something so with a higher smoke point. So what do you use? Is more like just a vegetable oil? Yeah, like vegetable oil, canola oil. Um, when you deep fry things like peanut oil, things like that, like you could never deep fry something in olive oil, if that makes sense, because right. the smoke point is so low that it would literally like begin to smoke and theoretically could catch on fire before you even get it to the proper heat. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize that, Josh. Yeah. So Josh, tell me where this is going and take us through these next steps. But sure. When did you know that, that you had a love for cooking and what, what attracted you to this prof profession of becoming a chef? Yeah, so I think my favorite thing about cooking, I'm really big on nostalgia in general. Yeah. So I love the way that cooking can kind of take you back in time to a forgotten memory. You know, it's similar to music, I feel, in that regard. Yeah. You know, like you hear a song you haven't heard in forever, and it can just like almost take you back in time right. to a forgotten memory. I love that about food. Um, I love the way that, you know, cooking can make people happy, you know. Yeah. It, it, it's such a beautiful thing when you can cook for someone and have them appreciate it and like, it enhances their day or their mood. It's just a beautiful thing. No, that is a beautiful thing. I, I, uh, you can take us through the next step. Oh, sure. Well, I was going to multitask here while okay. the beef is browning. I think it's just about ready to turn, actually. So before we start on the onion, I can't see yours, Lou, but you should be starting to see some browning in the bottom of the pot, maybe some loose flour that's uh, around the beef, like starting to turn brown. You should yes. have some visual indicators of it being about ready. Now, when you're cooking in one of these enameled cast iron pots, you want to use a wooden spoon or something that's not metal. I did bring a pair of metal tongs. <laughs> we could carefully kind of flip them over if that's easier for you, but you want to be careful not to get in and gouge that enamel because these are very expensive pots. You could actually ruin it by doing that and then not really? be able to use them anymore. Okay. It's interesting. But So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through there, 
and kind of try to flip them over. Alternatively, you could certainly just use your spoon and get in there, you know. But I'm trying to just carefully pay attention to detail and make sure that I get nice browning all over the meat. Like I said earlier, this is what's really going to develop the flavor in this dish. If you skip this step, you're never going to have as deep a flavor as you would otherwise. So I'm kind of just turning the pieces of meat over, making sure I got a nice deep brown. Some of these pieces weren't quite ready to turn, but that's okay, they'll get there in time. I love what you said about uh, food bringing back memories. And you know, one of the things in, in my line of work is I end up going to a lot of funerals. I travel a bit mm -hmm. and, and uh, one of the funerals that I remember the most of all was uh, Rocco Amaduri um, from Rocco. is the oh, famous yeah. you know, pizza shop right here in town that has become a, a site for so many. And I've never seen a longer line at a funeral than at Rocco's. Oh, wow. And Notre Dame people flew back from all around the country. And they said, I had my engagement dinner there. I met my wife on the first day oh, there. Wow. We used to go every Friday night of a football game there. And it was all about bringing back these memories that, that he and his family had built for so many families. And what a, what a powerful tribute it is to think that food can create memories like Absolutely. That. It's the universal language, you know. Yeah. It's something that regardless of your culture or where you're from, I mean, everybody can relate to yeah. good food, right? That's Hopefully. exactly right. Now, you've been here as a chef for 12 years. Yes. At Notre Dame, and you could be anywhere. Um, why is it that you're so passionate about being a chef at Notre Dame? Oh, I love Notre Dame in general. I grew up a Notre Dame football fan. I never thought that I would end up working here one day. Yeah. But uh, so I've always appreciated it the whole time I've been here, but never more so than now with everything going on. You know, I feel so fortunate to be here at Notre Dame and have a secure job in these uh, trying times, especially in this industry. I have so many friends who aren't as fortunate, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're lucky to have you here, and I know that... Uh, oh, thank you. I have to give you, you know, Legends for a long time was, you know, I don't know how to say this, but not many people went there, you know, for meals. And in the last few years, and your leadership, it's, it's, it's hopping. Oh, wow. It's just bustling, and, and it's, you made it into a place that's the go-to place here on campus, so congratulations. Thank You've you. done a terrific job there, Josh. Thank you, Lou. That means the world, sincerely. So I'm, I can't really see what you have going on. Are you getting some nice browning going on? <laughs> um, you know, I just realized that uh, my burner had uh, not oh, been properly it? turned on. Oh, so I'm no. a little behind the curve So you're here. a little bit behind. Yeah. But it's, uh, it, there, it is, there is some browning taking, taking place. Well, that's good. <laughs> Let's see. So mine's getting close to the point where I'm almost ready to take it out. Um, so okay. once you get it fully browned, what I'm going to do, sides, right? It should be brown on all sides. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So once you get there, what I'm going to do is carefully take it out of the pot and transfer it over to just a little pan that I have with some paper towels in it. It'll kind of absorb any extra grease. And we're going to obviously return the beef to the pot later on. How much would, would one of these Le Creuset? Depending on the size, uh, upwards of 350 to $400. Ooh, so it's an investment. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But it'll last you your lifetime, you know, if you take care of it and yeah. don't use metal utensils in it. <laughs> okay. Back, yeah, so all of these little beautiful brown bits on the bottom of the pan, you definitely want to leave those in there, and that's going to be the foundation for the stew. Oh, okay. So... It's, it's called fond in culinary terms, okay. um, but eventually we're going to deglaze it with a little bit of the Guinness and kind of work it up off the bottom of the pot, and then that will incorporate into the liquid. Great. And that's what gives it that depth of flavor that I was talking about earlier, you know. You can't get that just by putting everything into the crock pot, if you will, you know what I mean? Got it. You could, you could cook this in there and you would get, you know, tender meat and tender vegetables and you could season it up with salt and pepper and garlic, but hopefully when you taste our version later, you'll see what I mean by depth of flavor. It, it. Uh, should really ring true. Can I put a question from the sure. Uh, Rachel from Dallas, Texas wrote in and said, if you don't have a Dutch oven, what is your secondary recommendation for a cooking pot? 
Absolutely. So I tell you, you know, I don't mean to disparage crock pots, but what I would do is take like a big skillet and sear the beef in the skillet first and then transfer it over to a crock pot or anything. You could use any kind of pan, a baking pan with a, uh, I would obviously film wrap it and foil it, but then you could just transfer it to the oven at 350 degrees. Now the one thing I want to point out is we're not going to just put everything in there and cook it all together. We're going to start out after we get the beef browned up and uh, the vegetables peeled. We're going to put the onions in here and cook them a little bit and the tomato paste and the celery and the garlic. But then we're going to put the beef back in and that's going to cook with the Guinness and the stock for about an hour on its own before we add any of the potatoes and the carrots and parsnips. So I, I digress, but the point of that was that if you're making it at home and using multiple pots, what I would do is start off with a big skillet. Now I'm going to turn this down so it doesn't burn well, while I'm working on the next so step. So you're putting the meat now into, you have yes, sir. some paper down. Yeah, some, some thick napkins. Place. You could use a towel, you could use, you don't have to use anything, but it's just going to absorb a little bit of that extra well, grease. Okay, so it's a way to take some of the grease out of the stew, yes. ultimately. Now I turned my burner off just because I don't know how long it's going to take us to get to the next stage. Got it. But alternatively, you know, you could just turn it down to low. But what we're going to do is we're going to dice this onion. The recipe that I provided called for two, but this is a really big onion. So I think that one is going to be plenty. Got it. Um, have you ever diced an onion, Lou? I'm not trying to be funny. Um, you are not being funny, and I have never done it, <laughs> awesome. I believe. I mean, well, I'm going to teach you the proper way to dice an oven. Okay. All right, an Good. oven, an onion. Excuse me. So if you slice it straight through the root end and through the tip and half it, you want to leave that root in, intact. And that's actually going to hold the onion together as we dice it. I'll be darned. I was always cutting the onion the other way. Yeah, most people do. So huh. if you look at it, you can see the root on one side and then the other side doesn't have the root. We are going to take the side without the root off and go ahead and square that up. OK. And then I'm just going to put my peelings in this old bowl over here. Hey, Josh, while you're peeling the, the sure. onion, we have another question. This is from Mark from Miami, Florida. And Hi, this question is, should the beef be cooked through thoroughly at this point in the process or pink inside still? No, pink inside is great. We just want to get nice browning on the outside. Um, we're going to return this beef and have everything cooked together, you know, for several hours. So the beef will certainly come up to temp eventually. This is one of those uh, meals where you're going to cook the beef until it's like fall apart tender. It's not like, you know, if you were cooking a steak and you cook it to medium or medium rare or something. Um, so no, you don't want to cook it all the way. I mean, if, if, if you did leave it in the pan and it did cook, you know, till it was done, it wouldn't necessarily be a problem though, if that makes sense. Um, the next step in dicing this oven, I keep calling it an oven. <laughs> an onion, yeah. I don't know how you dice an oven, but we're going to try. <laughs> um, the next step in dicing this onion would be to take the half that you have with the root end intact. And you can see how the onion grows. It grows like with a curvature to it, right? Yeah. So this next step, we're going to horizontally put a couple of slices in the onion. You don't have to, you know, do too many, just like two or three. Be careful in this step, you know. Yeah. Obviously, you want to be careful not to cut yourself. So have you ever had, like, have you ever injured yourself? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> not too many times with a knife, though. Uh, for me, it's more burns or with my height, I have a tendency to hit my head on things. <laughs> Luckily, in the kitchen at Legends, I don't do that too often. So but, uh, safety, when you know, cooking safety, especially when you're the chef and you've got a lot of other people, it's got to be something you take pretty seriously, oh, right? Oh, absolutely. 100%. Whether I'm at home or here, you know, on campus at Legends, that's obviously something that's at the forefront of our mind. Just throw the stuff in here, okay. There are plenty of ways to hurt yourself in a kitchen, that's for sure. So anyway, like I was saying, after you do a few horizontal slices in the oven, mm -hmm. gosh, and the onion, the onion, you want to <laughs> come back through on top and kind of set yourself up for success with about five or six slices across it that way. And then you just come back through and dice it up. And what that does is, I don't know, if, if the people at home have experienced this, when you're trying to dice an oven, you get uh, an onion, you get a lot of irregularly shaped pieces. And if you do it this way, you get a more consistent cut. 
So I did turn mine off, but it should just just a second to get back up to temp. We're going to put all the onions in there. You're putting the whole onion in. Yes, sir. That's great. And the moisture, the water content in the onion will actually help uh, start to release some of that fond off the bottom of the pot as it cooks. Now at home, you might realize you need to put just a little bit of oil in there. Mine looks pretty good. I'm going to put just a little bit. Josh, we have another question. Sure. Sarah from Detroit, Michigan asked, does it matter which type of onion you use? Yeah, so there are different nuances in the flavor of onions. This is a uh, sweet onion, a yellow. Just a, there's a, I don't think it ultimately matters per se. You know what I mean? It will give a slight nuance of a different uh, in the taste. But I think you could use anything. I personally wouldn't use a red one just because while the flavor is similar, it's going to give a different look to the dish. I think, you know, if you were in a pinch and that's all you had, though, you could certainly use it. I prefer the, uh, the yellow onions. They have a, a little bit more of a sweetness to them, especially when you're working with these kind of ingredients like Guinness and tomato paste. You want a little bit of sweetness. We'll get that from the carrot and the parsnip as well. It kind of balances out the dish. How did you get this onion into the pan? You just scraped it into like a this and like this and then just put it in? That'll work, yeah. Okay. You don't have as versatile of a cutting board as I do, Lou. I was able to pick mine up. You've got that big Round giant one. wooden one. <laughs> I don't think you'd be able to pick that up very yeah, easily and then just on the, on the floor. scoop it in. Sorry about that. No, 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 no. So I'm also going to dice up the celery at this point. Every so often give your onions a stir. Now, at this, uh, like I said, the fond on the bottom of the pot, we want to eventually get that to release from the pot. It will um, become the foundation of the flavor for the dish. So as the onions are cooking, you can kind of use that wooden spoon to kind of stir up a little bit of that fond off the bottom. Okay. So I've got the onion diced up and in there. I'm working on the celery now. Now, I like to cut my celery fairly small, but that's just a matter of personal preference, you know? I, I take my celery and onions fairly small, and then I'm going to leave the uh, parsnips and carrots and potatoes all about the same size, but a little bit bigger. For me, you know, when I'm eating a stew, I don't like big chunks of celery. While I like the flavor that it imparts, you know, yeah. texturally, I would like it to be a little bit smaller. So that's just a personal preference. Josh, we have a question all the way from Dublin, Ireland. Oh, wow. Whoa. So it's Nina, and her question is, how many portions does this Guinness stew serve? Well, it depends how hungry you are, but I would say between four and six. It's pretty impressive when you're getting a question from Dublin yeah, on really uh, Guinness cool. stew. So I'm going to uh, start mincing the garlic, and I'm going to take the little root off of the end. I'm just going to chop that off real quick. Put that into my scrap bucket. Have you ever worked with garlic glue? Uh, I'm Italian, so um, I wouldn't say that I've worked with it other than doing just a hell of a lot of it, you know, over the years, and, and uh, I love garlic, and we were even, you know, we were told as kids that, uh, that you would, you'd wear garlic. My, my, my <laughs> grandmother was from Italy, and my grandparents were, and, and they used to say, like, you know, to ward off evil spirits, they'd oh, wow. put, like, a lock of garlic around you and, and stuff, and it was always... It was also good, like with a bee sting, they'd rub garlic on it and stuff like that. So oh, wow. Garlic was a big staple. Yeah. Well, the best way to mince garlic is to pull it back, the clove, after you remove the root, and oh. take the side of your knife, and you want to be careful, obviously, that you don't hit the sharp edge. You just slap it down and crush it. It's going to make it a lot easier to kind of mince up. Oh, I almost lost that one. Anyway, Impressive. once you have it all smashed, you can just kind of run your knife through it. Again, you know, I like to take this fairly fine, but in a long cooking stew like this, if, if you have, you, you could throw it in there like this, to be honest. How often do you like sharpen your knife in the work that you That's do? That's a great question. Yeah. So sharpening the blade, you really, if, if you take care of your knife and maintain it properly, you only need to do that every couple of months. And the way that you maintain it is with, have you seen on TV the chefs where they use like that steel rod and they run their yeah. knife along the edge of it? Right. So 
that actually, while it doesn't sharpen your knife per se, like you can't put an edge on a knife with that, but it maintains the edge that's already on the knife. So every time we use the knife cutting vegetables or whatever, you're doling it. And what that rod does is it trues the blade, if you will. So okay. it kind of returns it to straight. And uh, so, so as long as you- pretty after every time you use just it. Just about, yeah. yeah. That, that will uh, definitely increase the longevity of the sharpness. Got it. So I didn't go super fine with my garlic. You know, I left it fairly rustic. That's one of the beautiful things about a stew. It's kind of getting, I'm sorry, I was getting a little bit of a, a hunger for the celery. It's really good, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's part of my problem. The little bit that I cook is I eat a lot of it while I'm cooking. You ever have that problem? <laughs> Not with celery. But <laughs> <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> okay. But yeah, definitely. I always tend to overproduce on the food. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? That way it takes things like that into account. Right. While I'm not real big on leftovers, something like this, it's always nice to have the next day. As a matter of fact, uh, things like stews or braised items, a lot of times people say they're better the second day, like a chili or something like yeah. that. After the flavors have time to marry. But so... I've got a nice saute going on my celery and onions and garlic and we're almost to the point now where I'm going to add the tomato paste. This is another crucial step in this process. We're actually going to cook the tomato paste a little bit. And that again, you know, develops the flavor. It adds a depth that you're just not going to get, you know, if you skip this step. Now you don't want to burn the tomato paste. So once I put it in there, I'm going to stir it fairly regularly. Jim. And then as soon as we get the tomato paste, you can start to smell it and you see the color change a little bit. We're gonna go ahead and deglaze the pan with this Guinness. So Are these like basil leaves or what do you have in there? Yeah, you? bay leaves. Yes, bay sir. Bay leaves, bay leaves. Okay. So bay leaves add a ton of flavor to anything that you're cooking, but you wanna be careful to remove them when you're done. I don't oh. know if you knew that, you can't really digest them and people have choked on them before. So like, oh, really? yeah, interestingly enough, you got to be really careful to remove them before you serve it to somebody. That's good to know. I think I'm going to remove mine right now. <laughs> You're not going to get that depth of flavor. That's right. <laughs> so I'm actually going to put, you can go ahead and put the bay leaves in there now too, along with the tomato paste. And as soon as the bay leaves come in contact with the heat and the grease and a little bit of the water coming out of the vegetables, they'll soften. Um, so another I'm just question from the audience, Jim? Josh, I have another question. This is Terry from Washington, D.C. Hi, Terry. Terry wants to know why tomato paste versus tomato sauce sure. or so another this type is, of canned tomato. Yeah, so this is just uh, basically tomato sauce that's been reduced down to the essence of tomato. So it's just a little bit thicker. Uh, we don't really want, I mean, if that's what you had at home, you could use that and you'd get similar flavor, but using this paste... Because, uh, you know, once you reduce it down, it obviously, like, concentrates the sugar that's already in the tomatoes. So it's a little bit different as far as how it reacts. Um, as you can see, I don't know if you can see in my pot, you got to be really careful that it doesn't burn. Like, you want it to change color, and you want it to, uh, you, can, you can smell it, you know, as, as, as it changes a little bit. I don't know how to describe it, but it goes, like, that canned kind of smell goes away. <laughs> yeah. And you begin to smell, see I can smell the garlic and the tomatoes. Cooking, you know, is using all your senses. So what's your favorite cooking show? You, you must watch the cooking channel. Yeah, yeah as far as shows, um, Top Chef is my favorite one of all the like competition style shows. I yeah. love that. Um, I love the, uh, the British baking show is really fun to watch. I don't know if you've seen that. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, in, in what, um, what would you, uh, do you have a favorite chef of all time? I do. It's uh, Rick Bayless. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He's a chef out of Chicago who specializes in Mexican food. Huh. But I grew up watching him on PBS. Uh, uh, Mexico, One Plate at a Time was the name of the show. And I, who would have thought, you know, back then yeah. that I would grow up to become a chef. But, yeah, so have he's always kind him? of been have my favorite. Have you ever favorite. met Rick? Or no? I have, yeah. Have. A few years ago, I was lucky enough... Um, I went up there with a few other chefs from campus. Riley, who's going to be doing yeah. the next version right. of this, and uh, Chef Greg from North Dining Hall. And we had dinner at one of his restaurants, and we were lucky enough to meet him and get our picture taken with him. It was awesome. Well, that's great. Yeah, it was really cool. It's 
So tell me about those really, do you really wear those big, tall paper hats? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it's called a toque. A toque? Yeah, and it, you know, it's something that chefs kind of take pride in. Originally, I believe the story that was that uh, the different lines in it represented how many different ways a chef could cook an egg. Oh, really? Yeah. And how many, you know how many lines there are? Or I don't, no. <laughs> That's amazing. And, uh, I guess so it when depends you're working, how good the chef is. <laughs> when you're working, do you, do you actually wear that hat around? I'll be honest, uh, I don't a lot of times. I keep my hair obviously pretty short, so yeah. I don't have to worry about hair getting in the food. But for me, it's more of a height issue. As I said earlier, I have a penchant oh, for hitting right. my head on things. That's right. <laughs> but especially when I extend my head, you know, by five how, or six how inches. How tall are you? I'm almost 6'5", six 6'4"-ish. Six yeah. yeah. We were talking a little bit earlier, right here from Elkhart, um, nearby, grew up in Concord High School. Excellent. Uh, a tight end and, and uh, defensive end and played uh, uh, basketball following Sean Kempf. Oh, I don't want to miss this next step. So you're just pouring? <laughs> you're yeah, pouring so in? about three quarters of this can. The recipe called for a 12 ounce can. This one's a little bit bigger. But as you pour it in, you know, I kind of poured it all at once because I didn't have too much fond. You know, if you have a lot of fond, those little burn up bits on the bottom of your pan, you can just kind of do a little bit of Guinness at a time. And every time you put it in, it will steam up and release some of that fond. Um, but I was able to just kind of put most of mine in there at once because I've been stirring mine up as we go. Josh, we have a question from Atlanta, Georgia. Cheryl wants to know, what does the beer do to the stew and what is special about adding it? Sure, so this beer in particular has different um, uh, characteristics to it you know, with it being a stout. It's not like uh, just pouring, you know, a lager or something in there. This will actually add to the overall depth of flavor that I talked about earlier. Um, there's a little bit of maltiness in this. You know, there's a little bit of sweetness that as it reduces down will come out. And um, it's just, you know, it's all about that depth of flavor, kind of like I described earlier. You yeah. know, it's going to add a whole nother layer to what you're, what you're experiencing. And this would be Irish stew, if it weren't for the Guinness, it would be just considered Irish stew. And what would you put in instead of the Guinness? Well, you don't necessarily need any kind of beer. You could just use beef stock. Okay. Um, it, you know, it, it would be different, you yeah. know, like I said, but it would certainly work. And speaking of beef, beef stock, this is the time that we add that. So do you have everything kind of stirred up in there? I do. All right. We'll go ahead and... Still worried about swallowing those bay leaves, but yeah. <laughs> put it all in. Yep, How many we'll ounces put all, is this? All the beef stock. It's, I'd say it's about two and a half cups. Okay. I think the recipe that I created called for two cups, but like I said earlier, it all depends what kind of pot you're using. This has a lot of surface area, you know, so obviously things yeah. spread out more. So we needed a little bit more liquid. If you had something that was taller, you know, it might not right. need as much. It kind of, it's not probably the best thing to say for home cooks, but I, I like to say, you know, let common sense be your guide. Don't be chained to the recipe, you know, use it as a, a guide, you yeah. know, for the ingredients and kind of the amounts and the ratios. But uh, I don't know, I like to cook from the heart, you know, and obviously yeah. you need experience to be able to do that well, but I think anybody could do it to a certain extent. Right. Um, so now we've got the beef stock, the beer is in, we're just going to bring this back up to a uh, simmer, and then we're going to put all of the beef back in. Now, like I said earlier, you could do this in the oven, but we're going to leave it stove top. And once we return the beef, we're going to kick it down to where it's at just a light simmer. And then we're going to put okay. the lid on it, and then we're going to let it cook for about an hour. Okay. Now, obviously, we're not going to do that during this filming session, right. but if you're making it at home, just know that the beef takes longer to cook and get tender than these vegetables are going to. So if you put it all in at the same time, you know, the beef could be super falling apart by the time the vegetables are done. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about staging and timing. So, so it should be ready at this point. We put the beef in and it should be ready in about an hour. The beef will not be ready, but it'll be ready to add the rest to it, if that oh, makes sense. Oh, I'm sorry. That oh, no, that's got okay. It. Got it. So we let the beef before we put yeah, it Yeah, it just needs it. a little extra time. I'm not sure I explained okay. it that well. No, 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 I got it. But so I'm going to put all of my beef back into the pot.
So have you made this before? Yes. And do you serve it sometimes at Legends? So I would love to serve it at Legends. Um, I've never served it at Legends before, mm -hmm. but I think it's a great dish to do there, especially during St. Patrick's Day coming up. I think the one challenge would be, now that we're carry out only, you know, how do you serve a stew to go and have it still feel, you know, when you get it home, it, it's not, I mean, obviously the stew will still be good, but basically what we need is a nice disposable thing to serve it in, you know, like right. a bowl. That's kind of a limitation, you know, we have these nice, like, thick gauge plastic cups that we put cups of soup in. I guess we could do multiple ones of those. Josh, we have another question for you. This is Tim from Louisville, Kentucky. Hi, Tim. He wants to know, what changes do you recommend making if I want to make this as a vegetable stew only? Sure. So, not many uh, other than omitting the beef, to be honest. This is going to be such a flavorful stew that the beef is nice, but you really don't need it. And as long as you adhere to the techniques that I'm showing as far as, you know, um, so, yeah, without the beef, you're going to miss uh, the browning of the beef with the flour. So what I would do is maybe uh, consider taking something like uh, just the flour in the pan, you know, initially, because you're going to need that to thicken. So what I would do is um, when you're sauteing your onions and your carrots, and your celery, and instead of, uh, I, I would put flour in there with the tomato paste, if that makes sense. So a little bit of flour in there with the tomato paste and kind of cook it down, and you'll, you'll help develop the flavor a little bit that way. Now uh, you kind of caught me off guard with that one. I wasn't uh, ready for that. But uh, I think you could still make a really flavorful stew without the meat for sure. But uh, you'll definitely want to use the Guinness and the Worcestershire and deglaze your pan, you know, cook the tomato paste, all the steps that I've showed you. The one that I kind of had to think about was how do we incorporate the flour because we're not tossing the beef and flour and then searing it. So that is a little bit of a tricky one, you know, because obviously mm -hmm. you have to have the flour in there to get the uh, thickened final product. So to be honest, if it were me, I would probably make a roux on the side with the flour and do everything else the same way and then kind of introduce the roux with the stock as you um, okay, what's a roux? add the potatoes. So roux is equal parts uh, butter and flour that you kind of cook in a pan a little bit at a medium heat okay. until it changes color and the floury smell dissipates a little bit. Got it. It's used to thicken sauces, soups, um, gravies, things like that. Got it. But uh, so yeah, sorry, you kind of caught me off guard there, but uh, now that I've thought about it, that's what I would do, you know, saute all the vegetables just like you would, um, maybe do the onions and celery in the pan, do the bay leaves, the uh, tomato paste, and then in a separate little skillet, make yourself a roux, equal parts flour and butter. For this uh, size of a batch, I would say, do like four ounces of butter and four ounces of flour, maybe two or three, somewhere in that range. Uh, yeah, I'd say like two and a half, three ounces of flour and the same amount of butter. Cook it in a pan for, I'd say, three or four minutes on medium heat, and then kind of reserve that to the side. And then once everything has come together, you have the beer. Um, instead of beef base, obviously, you'd want to use vegetable stock, something like that. Um, uh, but then add the roux, and then let the stew do its thing, and it should cook and uh, it should thicken up during the cooking process. Obviously, it wouldn't take as long since you don't have the meat. So I'd say instead of the uh, three-hour cook time, we'd be looking at about half that without yeah. the meat. Are you seeing a lot of changes, Josh? In in kind of U.S. dietary habits, more like at the restaurant, you've got to offer more vegan, more vegetarian alternatives. Definitely, yeah. yeah. I think the, uh, the trend is going toward more healthy eating for sure, you know. So yeah. we're always trying to find ways to creatively change the menu or offer things that, you know, Different would appeal alternatives. to that. Different alternatives, yeah. Mm -hmm. So our, uh, my two favorite cooking movies would be Babette's Feast and Big Night. Have you seen either I've one I've seen of those? Big Night. I love that one. Love I've never seen one. Babette's Feast. Babette's I'm not Feast with is, that. Uh, I want to say it's from Sweden. Uh, so it's a foreign film. You'd love it. So wow. watch it, Babette's Feast. I would love to see that. But yeah. do you have a favorite, uh, favorite cooking movie that, that comes to mind? 
I do. I have a few. So I love the movie Chef. I don't know if you've seen that with John That's, Favreau. Oh, John Favreau. Okay. Yeah. And uh, but I tell you what, you might laugh. Ratatouille is awesome. <laughs> I see, love that movie. See, my kids love that, and I, I said I, I never could get over the idea of a rat making yeah, that food. Part, it's a little. I'm bit, with you. It's a stumbling block for me. So. I struggled with that part too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But it's <laughs> but it is really it's really good. It is really good. Yeah. There's the one scene where uh, the food critic tastes. Um, the food and like we talked about earlier it kind of takes him back to a childhood memory yeah you know? and I, I just love that part it resonates and, and, with me and have you been cooking at a time where you've had a food critic come into your restaurant were you like super nervous or uh yeah i believe uh we had something like that in the morris inn <laughs> we had a really important night over there one night i was definitely nervous but it was less pressure because i wasn't in charge then but it was still a lot of pressure and i was definitely nervous i've never really had to deal with that as an executive chef mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. though i have you know throughout my apprenticeship i was uh, involved in a few culinary competitions you know where i was judged and they just kind of watched everything you did and critiqued you not only on the final product but you know your technique and everything so that was certainly nerve-wracking Interesting. So, Josh, uh, we have yeah, another question. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, from South Lake, Texas. Anne wants to know, does it matter if the Guinness is bottled or canned? No, it does not matter. Good question, though. You could even use uh, draft if you had it nearby. So we're peeling the parsnips and carrots. And then we're going to peel the potatoes. Now, like I said, this would cook for an hour before we would add these. Please don't forget that. Now, do you use much parsnip in your recipes? Uh, not a lot. So I like to use it in co combination with other root vegetables. As you can see here, we've got carrots and we've got about twice as many or twice as much carrot as we do parsnip. I like that little bit of uh, flavor that parsnips gives, but uh, it can be a little overwhelming. I'm going to taste. Can I take a little taste of the parsnip? I'm not sure. sure what it tastes like. <laughs> it's going to taste better after it cooks, but yeah, it's, it's it tastes gotta, a lot like uh, like a carrot. Yeah, carrots a little sweeter. Mm hmm But certainly in the same realm. So, what's your go-to dish if you were to like you had one meal, you really wanted to impress some loved ones? and you could prepare something, what would be your dish? Well, uh, I love making Italian food. I mm -hmm. think you'd appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So like a nice bolognese or just a meat sauce, you know. Mm -hmm. I'd love to make the pasta from scratch, time permitting. Uh, yeah. that's, that's the way to go for sure. But I, I love, just comfort food in general is my favorite thing to cook, you know. I mean, obviously I, I love fine dining and, you know, high-end items, but I think one of my favorite things, you know, for the reasons that we said earlier with, you know, like helping people connect to their past or, you know, I love comfort food. It's, it's so awesome. Was there somebody that, that was a cook in your life that, that cooked comfort food that... Sure. Yeah. So uh, my great grandmother, Helen, when I was a kid, she used to do this uh, beef and noodles dish where she would roll out the noodles from scratch. And it was funny, you know, now as a chef looking back, I think of it kind of like a little scared but yeah I remember as a kid she had these chairs in her kitchen and noodles would just be strung over the backs of the chairs to dry out like <laughs> anything she could find they were on. <laughs> probably seems a little unsanitary yeah. now looking back but yeah it was I mean in my mind at least the best food ever you know it was and yeah. she so she had the touch yeah exactly what she was doing that's great Josh we have a question for you uh, this comes from Regina from Bangor Maine and she wants to know, can I swap out vegetables that I prefer in this dish? Yeah, you could, but I guess it depends on what they are. You know, different vegetables have different cooking times. And like I said earlier, it's all about staging the ingredients so that everything is kind of done at the same time. So these are both root vegetables, and they have a similar cooking time as potatoes, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess depending on what they are, absolutely you could. Now, the flavor profile will change, mm -hmm. certainly. But um, yeah, there's some uh, flexibility there. The geographic distribution of questions, Jim, is amazing. Yeah, From is that Bangor, intentional? Maine to Texas to all over Dublin. It's impressive. Definitely. 
I'm so, getting really excited about tasting this. It's starting to smell good, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, every so often, I'd get in there and stir, make sure it's not, you know, sticking to the bottom. But as long as you have it on like a nice medium low heat, you really don't have to stand over it, that's for sure. You kind of just let it do its own thing. Um, so back to the vegetables. Do you have them all peeled up? Oh, yeah. Are you getting there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we want everything to be the same size. You know, depending on how big you cut them, the longer they will take to get tender. Um, but like, what I like to do, it's got the cylindrical shape, obviously. Yeah. This is called a roll cut. Now I'm coming in at an angle, like a 45 degree angle, and then I'm just going to roll the carrot over and then do it again. Oh, you see what I'm doing there? I'm yeah. cutting little tiny wedges with it. And right. they're going to cook, you know, at the, same, at the same rate. And then once you get up into the uh, wider part, I'm yeah. going to split it in half and then kind of continue to do the same thing. You can do the same with your carrots. And then once we get to the potatoes. Do you use the roll cut a lot? Ah, uh, for these types of vegetables, absolutely. So I'm kind of coming in here. This one I'll kind of cut in half. But anyway, like I said, you just, and then I'll quarter that actually. You just want consistent sizes, really. I mean, so you, you, could, you could do slices, like round slices. So we have a lot of, you know, people who are passionate about cooking, watching the show, and not all of them are going to be able to take the years to apprentice and go to culinary school and so forth. What would you recommend to them if there were like a program uh, to, to acquire skills? What would be something that you could do practically in the short term that, that might make sense? Well, depending on where you're at, you could always uh, take a class or two at a, like here we have Ivy Tech. Mm -hmm. Anybody can take class there. You know, they have a basics class there that you could take. Um, there's all kinds of YouTube videos. What I would recommend is just uh, figuring out what you enjoy to cook, watch a few videos of a chef doing it, you know, and then try to do it at home. Um, as far as technique, like I said, you know, there's books and videos you can watch. But, yeah, uh, I hadn't thought about that. YouTube has got to ha have revolutionized. Absolutely. Do you ever, do you ever like, when you're, you got to be trying to innovate and experiment and do something new to keep yourself fresh. How do you do that? Do you, do you look uh, at YouTube for some ideas too? Uh, not really for ideas, you know. There's a lot of magazines that I get, you know, try to keep up with the trends. TV, another way, you know, yeah. see what other chefs are doing. You have to stay, you know, like we talked earlier, it's a constantly evolving industry, so right. you can't really stay stagnant. You have to kind of evolve with it, right? Do you get to go out and eat at other restaurants much? You don't have that much time off. Oh, I love to. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things to do, whether it's around here or if I'm in a new city especially. It's one of my favorite things to do is check out some new restaurants. And so you know who the chefs are that you want to go check out at some of these restaurants too? Uh, well, yeah, sometimes. Not yeah. always, you know. Yeah. But sometimes for sure. And I'm, uh, you know, through... I'm a member of the American Culinary Federation. That's who I did my apprenticeship with. And so obviously I'm still a member and we have monthly meetings. So I get to meet a lot of local chefs from different restaurants in the area and yeah. we network and you know, go to conventions. So I always stay up on what they're doing. So in South Bend, what would you say are some hidden jewels? Sure. Um, well, they just opened uh, Fat Bird downtown. That's really good. It's ran by the same people that uh, do Crooked U. I don't know if you're familiar yeah, with them. They sure do some am, good yeah. food. Um, and a little bit farther away in Mishawaka, I love Jesus. And that's the same people oh, that uh, own Corn Dance, which is another one of my favorite right. restaurants. Jesus Latin Grill. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah I love that place. One. But I've not been to Fat Bird yet because it's, it's just opened pretty recently, right? Yeah, within a few months, I'd say. Yeah. It's really good. Oh, that's good to hear. Good. Some Obviously, tips for you guys when you're back in town and you're looking to make... Yeah. You know, some reservations. Those are two, two great, you know, restaurants. A little bit off the beaten track. And of course, LaSalle Grill here in downtown South Bend is one of my faves as yeah. well. So if you want to just go out and just let go and just eat whatever, like, it, is it pizza? What is it that you like? Pizza is my favorite. Is it really? <laughs> yeah, and if I can uh, plug my favorite pizza place. Yeah, please. So it's in uh, Granger. Have you had Iggy's? Iggy's, no. It is incredible. I-G-G-Y-S? Yes. 
Iggy's in Granger. Yep, way out there in Granger. Um, so if you went down Like 20, in the old downtown of Granger? Yeah, yeah, I believe. Out there uh -huh. by that Martins, if you went down 23 all the way toward Capitol. Right. Yeah, it's phenomenal. It the is. The best ingredients, the best crust, everything is just top notch. Fantastic, and that's something you can order out right now. Yeah. So definitely, uh, all right, well, I'll have to check out Iggy's. That's exciting. So I've already uh, chopped up my carrots and parsnips. They're mm -hmm. all pretty much uniform size. And now I'm going to do the same thing with the potato. We're not going to do a roll cut with this. What I did is I took one slice. I'd say that's what, about a quarter inch, maybe a half inch. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to do it once, and then that will give it a stable base. Roll it over onto that base. Oh, interesting. Then it's a lot safer to uh, cut, right? You don't have to worry about it rolling on you as you're trying to cut it. So basically, I'm, I don't know, what is that? Like half inch? Yeah, about like half that. inch. And then we're going to take that, and we'll cut that like into strips like that, and then just dice it up from there. A little bit smaller than the uh, beef. You know, but basically, you know, like I said, you just want consistent sizes. That's the most important thing. Consistent size. Obviously, like, I would like them to be bite-sized, but they don't necessarily have to be. If you want to make, like, a really big rustic stew, you, you can have big chunks of potato. I mean, it's still going to be great. Josh, we have another question. All right. This comes from Sacramento, California. It's from Kim, and, says, and she wants to know, if we don't have fresh parsley for garnish, could we use something else? Absolutely. You don't need anything. Um, it does, I like garnishes to be functional. You know, I'm not the type to just want to put something on there just for the color. So flat leaf parsley actually has a little bit of flavor to it, whereas the curly parsley that you may have seen does not. Um, as far as something else, you know, another herb that would go really well in this would be thyme or, um, yeah, that's probably the first one I would go with. You know, you don't want something like basil in this. I don't feel like that would be the right flavor. But if you wanted to go with a fresh herb, thyme is probably the first one I would suggest alternatively. Um, but yeah, like I said, you don't really need it per se. If you don't have it, it's still going to be great. How are you coming over there, Lou? We're um, um, doing uh, moderate, moderate progress, I would say. <laughs> I'm getting a little caught up in watching you and just seeing how uh, there's some simple tricks to getting a flat edge on the potato and then just cutting from there, which is a lot safer way to go. And Absolutely. Would you call that cut again? Was it a spiral cut? You said? No, that, I think that was on the carrots. Yeah, uh, that's what one. you called this, the carrots with a spiral cut? Uh, that was, um, I'm sorry, I forgot. You forgot, okay. <laughs> Whatever it was, it was really fun watching it. The roll cut. Roll cut, that's it, roll cut. <laughs> it's also known as an oblique. An oblique, okay. In the shape. But so now we're to a point where we have everything uh, peeled and chopped up, and we could pretend that the beef has been cooking for an hour, right? Yeah. And then at that point, we would add all of the potatoes Carrots and parsnips. Give it a and nice. And how much longer stir. after you get that in would you cook for? I'd say when I made the uh, last batch, it took about an hour and a half to get everything where I wanted it. So, so after you after, put in, yeah, yeah so mm -hmm. another, so the, the, the meat is going to cook for two and a half mm -hmm. hours, so it's an hour and a half more. Yes, Interesting. sir. Interesting. Fantastic. And then after that an hour and a half? After that done. hour and a half, you should have something that resembles this. As you can see, the liquid has thickened up quite a bit. Oh yeah, got it. So the big stews in the different, you know, culinary traditions, kind of Irish stew, or as we're calling a Guinness stew right now, there's um, what, in Hungary, would it be goulash? Yeah, would absolutely. Would be one in, in what do they, in, France, they would call it like a... Oh, there's one called pot a few. There, there's probably a lot of different versions, but okay. yeah. Okay. So each of the major cooking traditions, or many of them, have something like this. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Do you know where it comes from? Was this be something that 
the, the kind of the common folk would eat, like, you know, yeah, a stew? peasant food. Peasant food. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's some of my favorite stuff. Yeah. For sure. I think that uh, even with humble ingredients, you know, if you have attention to detail, yep. and, you know, have good technique, you know, the results can be just as good, if not better, as, you know, mm -hmm. something that you've paid a lot of money to get, you know. Right. Like, I mean, you see what we're putting into this. It's not a lot of high-end stuff, but hopefully when you taste it, you'll agree, you know, like this is as good as anything you could get anywhere. When my dad grew up, uh, the family was very poor immigrant family from, from Italy, and my grandma times to save money, they would just make polenta and just put some, you know, homemade sauce on top of it. And he, he hated it in some ways because he felt like it was a peasant food, you know, and it wasn't. Now you go to some of the nicest <laughs> restaurants and get a polenta, you know, as featured as an appetizer or a meal or whatever. Yeah, so definitely. One. I think in the last 10 years, that's been one of the trends. Yeah. You know, there used to be humble cuts of meat, as they were known, like short rib, for example. We have right. a braised beef short rib on the menu at Legends. And it's, you know, traditionally a less expensive cut of meat. Right. But since it's come into vogue or popularity, interestingly enough, the prices went yeah. up and now it's, you know, as much as some of the other cuts. Good. <laughs> I'm for the underdog. You know, we <laughs> here at Notre Dame are, you know, kind of our whole mantra is uh, for the immigrant, for the underdog and, you know, the fighting Irish. So, um, you know, like some good peasant food. This is good. This is nice. Hey, Josh, we have another question. Sure. This is from Lake Tahoe, California. And the question is, do you need to peel the potatoes or can you keep the skins on? It's from Christina. Yeah, you could certainly keep them on if you would like. You know, I think there's more uh, nutrients in the skin. Um, but I find that texturally, I prefer them peeled, you know? But if, that's really the only thing. If you were gonna put them without, would you make sure you wash them? Absolutely. Thoroughly? Yes. Okay. I'm just gonna chop up a little bit of this parsley. We're gonna use that as the garnish, like we talked about. Looks like uh, our stew is just about ready. That's you definitely nice. want the flat leaf parsley. The uh, curly parsley has no flavor to it at all. That's masterful to watch. Jim, are you really, are these, these calls coming in, are they really from <laughs> all these different places? Or are you just trying to impress us? They're for real all over. Yeah. Impressive. That is really cool. Can you smell it? I can smell it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm starting to salivate over here like Pavlov's dogs. So we're going to serve this with some nice hearty bread. You could serve it with anything, you know. But I prefer something, you know, that you could, uh, if you were so inclined, you could get in there and kind of top up some of the juices with once you get toward the end. So in Ireland, I'm going to put my mask on to come and get it. So in Ireland, and oftentimes in, when you go into a pub, you can grab some stew, uh, is my understanding, right? You can, there'll be stew cooking in the background. You can order a Guinness stew or an Irish stew pretty frequently? Absolutely. So Wait one sec, I'm going to parsley that oh, up for yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> Looking a little uh, ambitious here. Sorry. Oh, no, no. I'm glad that you're eager for it. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> there you go, sir. Fantastic. Thank you, Josh. I'm pretty excited about this. Boy, it does have a, a thick base now. It's amazing how that changes over time. Yeah, it sure is. Like, even if we were to take the lid off of this one, it's not really thickening up much at all yet. I mean, it's starting to. You can see the, the flour there thickening it. Yeah. So you could do this with beef or you could do it with, with lamb. Lamb, yeah. And lamb is probably more traditional for this dish. You know, if you were in Ireland, like you said, I would imagine that it would most likely be served with lamb. And if you wanted to make it with lamb, you would follow excuse me, all of the same steps. It's okay. Just make sure you get a similar cut of lamb, you know. And with this beef, you know, we use chuck, and it's got a lot of fat to it. You know, you don't want something like, you wouldn't want to take like beef tenderloin and make a stew with it. It doesn't have enough fat in it. Okay. So you want like, for something that's going to cook for a long time, you want something with a higher fat content. Right. 
And so when choosing lamb, I would do the same, you know, like a shoulder or something like that. Are you ready? Yep, I am so ready. All right. Bon bless appetit. this food and bless this incredible chef. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Mmm. That's truly delicious. Thank you. You need uh, the meat just melts. <laughs> That's awesome. Hopefully you can taste some of the depth of flavor I was talking about. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different layers going on in there. That's really wonderful. Thank you, Lou. Well, I think uh, this has been a really great learning experience for me. Some of the simple cuts to, to everything else, but I know I know a heck of a lot less than most of our viewers, but I want to thank Josh uh, for joining us today. And what a blessing and what a privilege it is for us to have you as a chef here at Legends of Notre Dame. And I hope that when you're next on campus, which I hope will be soon, as campus will be opening up and, and we, we hope certainly for this football season, you'll stop by Legends, say hello to Josh, taste uh, uh, the, the great uh, food that he brings uh, to your table. I wanna thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedules uh, to join us today. Um, this is going to be a quick closing because I really do want to get back to the <laughs> stew. Um, we'll be posting a replay of the show later this evening at the same site. And uh, at that same site, you can find the recipe if it's something you want to do at a later date. Um, we will also post it on the Notre Dame or the ND Loyal YouTube channel. ND Loyal YouTube channel. Our next Fighting Irish Foodies is scheduled for Thursday, April 8th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so same time. And as Josh mentioned, we'll be joined by Notre Dame chef de cuisine, Riley Vissers, Riley Vissers, I'm sorry, Riley Vissers. And coming up in less than two weeks, taking you out of the food world for a second, we'll be hosting an exclusive chat live with a Notre Dame parent who at this very moment is circling Earth and the International Space Station. NASA astronaut Mike Hopkins will be joining us live from the space station at 3.35 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Thursday, March 24th. Mark your calendar. Um, we'll only have about 25 minutes or so uh, to speak with Mike because of the availability of satellites to handle the transmission of the signal back to Earth. So please be sure to join us. Lou? Yes. It's, it's 3.55 p.m. 3.55 p.m. It will be again on March 24th. So once again, from Chef Josh Marin and all of us here at Notre Dame, enjoy your beef stew. stew. Have a great St. Patrick's Day. And of course, God bless and go Irish. Thank you. <laughs>